our third session of the business planning boot camp, um, which is a collaborative series uh, between a number of local economic development agencies and our wonderful presenter today, Shelia Tuckweiler Dinkins, um, excuse me, Dawkins. Um, you know, um, those collaborators are uh, the SBA, the WBC, um, City of Columbia Office of Business Opportunities, you know, um, and the Small Business Development Center. And last but not least, the USC Columbia Technology Incubator. And, and I see we have Kate Stewart on uh, with us today, uh, who's the program and communications director there. Um, if you haven't had a chance um, to learn from today's presenter, you know, what you'll find out is that um, she's what I call a tax geek. And um, I, what I mean by that is she's someone who enjoys um, understanding um, the tax code and then clarifying that in a way that allows her clients you know, um, to be tax minimizer, minimizers and not tax evaders. Um, and then she'll also help you take you know, your um, business you know, from a financial perspective um, and grow it to a point where you can potentially, you know, um, generate um, some wealth from it. And so I, I think you definitely in for a treat today as, you know, uh, we go through our third session, um, focus on finance, you know, um, just a recap of the two sessions that we've had previously. We had um, first week, April 7th. Uh, we focus on the concept and ideation. And then week two, which was um, April the 14th, we focus on industry market analysis. And then this week, um, week three, we're going to go over uh, finance. And then the last week, we're going to actually talk about the marketing plan and some marketing actions that um, you can put into place to help you attract clients. So I'm going to turn it over to today's pre presenter, Shelia. Tutwiler Dawkins. Good morning, everyone. And I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, it has been a pleasure uh, over the last couple of weeks just to partake in this uh, amazing um, presentation. The goal for this class has been to kind of put you, walking you through the process as well as uh, providing you with information that will allow you to um, facilitate your business plan. When we're talking about the concept, we did talk about one of the things that Alan said uh, last week was, can you solve a problem? And more importantly, does that problem want to be solved? Once you uh, get your concept, uh, and Cheryl and Angela talked about your mission and your vision, uh, and you put it down on paper and you recognize that your concept and your market has a place for you, then the next thing you need to worry about, or think about is understanding your uh, business. And when I say understanding your business, that includes understanding your finances. So today is all about taking that concept taking that, those market trends, taking all of your research, and then what we're going to do is we're going to put it in uh, two numbers. I personally look at everything from a financial and a tax position. Last Monday was the last filing date for um, individual taxes, and if you had not filed, you should have filed an extension, but your taxes actually start January the 1st how your tax return will flow starts January the 1st and it, in, and it moves to December the 31st. For the most part, there is little <clears throat> that we can do to change the outcomes of that tax return after December the 31st. So <clears throat> it's important that you look at your business from not only a financial or a strategy, you also need to look at it from a technical as well as a uh, as well as a 
regulatory, tax regulatory feature. So today is about business planning, understanding your finances. I am Shelia Tuckweiler Dolphins, and I am the owner of Tuckweiler Dolphins LLC. The goal, my, <clears throat> my goal is uh, to assist small businesses in uh, strategic alliances, strategic leadership, organizational structure, as well as creating a plan for business su success. What drives your bottom line on your profit and loss statement, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute, has a lot to do with how your organizational structure, your strategies, your mission, your vision, your market um, research, that determines your profit. And one of the things that Alan said uh, last week that really made uh, me think is that you do want to be you do want to ensure that your pricing is competitive. However, being the lowest price in the market is definitely uh, can be a way for failure. So the goal of my firm is to provide financial services, tax calculations, and operational support to clients by effectively navigating the challenges of a dynamic environment. The goal is to increase, is to create relationships that promote integrity, accountability, transparency by educating clients and using proven methods that decrease taxes and increase growth and profitability. What did I just give you? I gave you my vision for my for my firm. Uh, I think if anyone has listened to me over any period of time, like you will you will know that uh, while I don't agree with all of Steve Jobs' uh, scenarios, one of the things about him is he uh, created something or, or created a product that we didn't even know that we that we wanted, that we desired. Uh, and he his 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 thought pattern was the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. And that's that's kind of like a, a goal of, for me. With his partner, Steve, he founded Apple Inc. in, in uh, 1976, transformed the company into a world leader in communications. He, he, he made it possible for, for literally, literally everything that we see now. And Apple is one of the driving force for, no, for new not, new technology, as well as our uh, cell phones. Uh, I'm not an Apple fan, I'm an Android fan. I don't like Apple to be, to be truthful, but his platform is how we have Samsung. And Sam, I'm a Samsung girl. <clears throat> so when we're looking at your financial concept, that is a, a, a broad picture in that we start with our value. Create a my concept. Create a value proposition. Is it something that someone wants, someone needs, and are they willing to buy it? We want to research and understand the market. After you do that, then you want to validate your 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 concept and be willing to adjust your concept. Uh, Alan said last week, "I have a great plan. I have a great concept. Google it." Because occasionally, that great concept that you have, it's like 300 other people have thought of that same concept, but you can tweak it in order to, to, to create the value. It's a, a, a circle, so to speak. None of these pieces actually are standalones. They actually are the process of building your business. Once you validate your concept and you and you feel like that it needs it can go, then you need to define how how are you going to create your revenue, set up your at that point set up your startup costs and build your team. And we're gonna just briefly talk about um, briefly talk about the leading the legal requirements because a lot of times we don't think about that, but that is something uh, that we need to. Uh, 
always keep in the forefront. We always talk about the marketing. We always talk about the, the, the social media platforms and we always talk about financing, but we also need to keep in that same uh, criteria, what are the legal requirements based on the, uh, the industry that I'm in. When I decided to go into uh, taxes and create my own company, I had a number of regulatory agencies that I had to fulfill in order for me uh, to get to that place. The first thing I needed to do was contact the IRS to make sure I could get uh, all of the qualifications that I needed in order for me to do um, e-filing. So if I could not have got that qualification, opening up a tax firm would be irrelevant because I can't sell the product. So making sure that you that you are thoroughly understand the legal requirements is cr as critical as well. Validating your concept, creating your value proposition, solving a known or unknown problem are critical in ensuring your that your ideas are marketable. The next step is you need to finance that baby. All right. Let's talk about basic accounting, just understanding basic accounting. The first thing you want to start off with is your balance sheet. Your balance sheet basically says who, what you own and can, can contribute to your business, who the business owes and the equity. Uh, in, in simple format, assets equals liabilities plus equity. If your assets are higher than your liabilities, meaning that you owe what you owe, your assets are your, um, and we're going on a personal level, your car, your house, your bank accounts, your stocks, those are your assets. If those assets are higher than your liabilities, liabilities would be your mortgage payments, your car note, um, then you have equity in your business. For example, your car, when you put it on the books, is worth $20,000. Now, there is a de depreciating factor that comes along that, that we, we can talk about as well. But for the most part, your car is an asset, $20,000. However, the asset is, is placed against that liability, because even though I drove off the lot with this brand new car that's worth $30,000, I actually owe the bank mm, $27,000. So my equity is, uh, is, is $3,000. A lot of times when we do financing, you want to make sure that you don't have neg negative, negative equity in that uh, my house is worth $100,000, but I owe the bank $110,000. So I'm actually $10,000 in the hole. So your balance sheet is first. Then your profit and loss statement. And for profit and loss statement, I'm talking about your income statement. For those who are sole prop proprietors, it will be your Schedule C. Your profit and loss statement is a moment of snapshot snapshot in time saying that as of March the 31st, I made X amount of dollars, I paid X amount of expenses, and at the end of the day, there's either a gain or a loss. That's a snapshot in time. Now you can keep your, you can, I mean, you want to start it, you may want, you may want to do it by March the 15th or March the 30th, but typically your balance sheet and your profit and loss sheets are within a, a 30 day, day period. For the most part, your balance sheet, when you go for funding, they'll ask you for your balance sheet as of the year end, and then they want you to update it as of March 31st or as of April 31st. Your profit and loss as of the year end, then you do it on a month to month basis. Your cash flow statement is something totally different. While the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement affect the cash flow, the cash flow is a continual, meaning that uh, it moves from one month to the next month, saying that 
Last month, I made a profit of $1,000. So my cash flow says that I have a profit of $1,000. This month, I made I lost fifteen hundred dollars, so my cash flow is a negative five hundred dollars because that moves that 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 that's the that's a continuation. Your cash flow is actually of all the statement your most important statement because it tells you the vi it shows the viability or the the viability of the liquidity of your uh, of your uh, firm. All right, the question came uh, last week about um, debt to debt to equity or debt to income ratio. I don't remember what. Oh, debt to equity, debt the, the debt ratio. So these are when you go and apply for a loan, your underwriter is going to look at probably the first two, the, the liquidity, which is your current ratio and your cash ratio, but we'll start with the profitability. It's just dividing your profits by your, your revenue. So if your profit is $10 and your revenue was $100, then your actual gross profit ratio is, is 10%. The operating ratio is, is, is another thing that we, we can talk about as well. Uh, but typically for the most part, you want to actually Pay attention to your gross profits. Pay attention to your return on investments. And your return on investment, it says, I want Shelia to invest in my business. Uh, I need her to give me $500. The first thing Shelia is going to want to look at is how am, am I going to receive any profit on uh, or any, a return on investment? We talk about cash ratio. That has to do with your cash and cash equivalent. Cash, when I say cash equivalent, and let me back up with the balance sheet. When you're looking at a, at a balance sheet and you're looking at your assets, the first thing you always deal with is what is your cash or what is your cash equivalent? And as the, as the numbers move down, what happens is it means that it's the least likely to be converted into cash. Cash and cash equivalent equals um, money's in the bank, your savings account, your money market. If you have stocks, accounts receivables, all of those things for the most part should be easily converted into, into cash. Then you look at other things like your uh, inventory. Inventory typically is next. That's something that, that you want to uh, convert into cash, or it is a, it's a way of uh, converting it into cash. When you look at your fixed assets, like your uh, computers, your uh, building, your automobiles, your goodwill, all of those things, those are less likely to be uh, converted into cash. For the most part, um, when we talk, and then the last piece of this is leverage. Leverage is quick ratio is another one that they look at. That's the current assets minus inventory divided by your current liability. When you approach a lender or investor, they look at several uh, ratios. Some of the ratios are self-explanatory. Others need an explanation. A cash ratio is considered good if it's between point. 50% up to a dollar. A dollar, uh, one, oh, it's, it's, we're talking percentage, I'm sorry. Any number greater than one typically means your business is healthy. The higher the debt is to your equity uh, is also better. On the other hand, if you're the lower, the, I'm sorry, the higher the debt to your equity, is not good. However, on the other hand, the lower the debt ratio is uh, better. So we're looking at the debt ratio, anything under 0 0.40 mean my total liabilities, I owe $20,000, but I've got $100,000 in the bank. So my debt 
to uh, my debt ratio is 0 0.20. Uh, are, are they, this is a good place for questions. Hey, Shulia, we had someone ask if you could say the equation again that you just mentioned. The debt ratio? Okay, I can go back to that one. Total, total liabilities divided by total assets. So let's take that card that we bought for $30,000. That, that $30,000 is going to be for just for, for practicality is going to be uh, so I'm gonna take that 30,000 and that's my numerator, my denominator. I had to think about that, numerator, denominator, <laughs> denominator. However, yeah. uh, my, I owe on that car $20,000. So that becomes my numerator. If I did, let me make these numbers round. Um, so I have a car, it's $100,000. I would never buy any kind of car for $100,000, but that's just so we can round it. That's my total assets. If my liabilities on that asset is $50,000, then that's 0. 0.50, which means that I have a higher debt ratio. Now let's take that same $100,000 and my I only owe on that $30,000, then that then that's 0 0.30. And I'm simplifying these. Um, I'm simplifying these uh, assets because you know assets typically have a have they are depreciated. So if I bought the car in 2019, and typically cars are are, are, are depreciated of five to seven years in 2022 that car has depreciated. So that same $100,000 has to show a, 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 a decrease in value. And you want that to, uh, so, your, so your payments should be going down as well. So the what I'm saying is over, oversimplifying it, but as we move forward, I hope, I hope I can give you a little bit more explanation on it as well. Did I answer the question? Yes, she said that she understands and she said, thank you. Um, the other question was asking if you're going to be addressing seed financing and how to approach investors for that seed funding. I am going to be address it on a peripheral level, um, but I will show you how what you need to do in order to at least be able to approach any investor. Any other questions? That's all the ones we've gotten in the chat so far. Okay. So now, he was someone is talking about seed um, investment, or when you when you go to a lender, you want to understand what your startup requirements are. That would include that you have validated your concept. You have researched your market, you understand what barriers, regulatory, uh, legal, what barriers you need to cross in order to get there. At that point, you want to take that information and create uh, what are your startup or startup requirements. I will say upfront, you need to have a clear understanding of where you're going in order to be able to understand how you're going to finance it. Uh, when we talk about your business plan, and this is this is me, Shelia, being honest. What I when I'm working with a client, I need to understand where they're trying to go in in order to provide them with strategic leadership as well as how to approach someone uh, when it relates to your uh, when it relates to your business or if you need financing. So the first question I will ask is, have you done the narrative portion of your um, of your business plan? Because the narrative portion drives what we need to have uh, our startup requirements are. So this is Shelia. 
I have, uh, I know that I am going to need white wet website and e-commerce. E uh, and then let me say this. When I started my business, I did a scavenger hunt through my house, number one. I said, okay, there's a desk over there that, well, no, it was, you know, the, the sofa tables that we put behind the couch. That became my desk. Uh, I have a computer, uh, take some lamps out of some bedrooms, set up my office, which meant that even though I needed some additional things such as computers, et cetera, I already own certain things. So the goal is to, if you're just starting off, to try to minimize what you have to spend that what we, that we call capital expenses because capital expenses are indirectly or indirect costs and they're not necessarily uh, generating business. If I have a desk, whether I'm sitting at the desk doing homework or whether I'm sitting at the desk uh, servicing, uh, servicing a client, it doesn't matter. So this desk theoretically does not provide, uh, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with my um, producing income, so to speak. So you have to look at capital, capital expenses, what is required in order for me to make money, that's where your funds need to go. What is what is required in order for me to set up? The limit that uh, the 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 thing about the e-commerce uh, situation would be that okay. So I need space to meet a client. I don't necessarily need office space. So I had to look at it from a different angle. So I didn't need any land. I didn't need any real estate because I am not uh, signing up uh, with a lease, then I don't need that. Now, if you are selling product, you may need uh, your uh, real estate and your, your buildings and your lease improvements. But because I did not need that, then, th then this is, um, I didn't have to use that. The top of your first, the, the things with your first requirements affect your assets. So my website and my e-commerce, I had to have a uh, website. I had to have uh, certain requirements as it relates to uh, security, uh, yeah, cybersecurity, regulatory stuff. So I had to, so I priced that out at $2,500. I needed robust computers. I needed several printers. So I priced that out as equipment. Now, if you need some, I mean, for me, equipment meant computers. Furniture and fixtures, I needed uh, things like um, furniture and fixtures, what are those? File cabinets, uh, file cabinets, printer stands. I needed a bookshelf, so I spent $1,500. Then I just put others because there are they're, they're little bitty things that I needed in order for me to uh, be able to take care of that. Uh, so then, so that became my fir the first part of my process. This is what I need in order to not open the door, but in order to, to say that I'm in business. This is the basis of your, uh, let me just say this, your balance sheet or not, and this is where most people will say, well, I spent X, Y, Z to start up my business. Can I write it off? In truth, the answer is no. It's not considered an actual expense now. There are some regulations that will allow that. Uh, you can take uh, the 179, uh, the one, section 179 allows you to depreciate everything all at one time. Uh, there are some new tax laws that came in 2019 and, tw and 2020 that allowed uh, individuals to take capital expenses and depreciated totally. I will say this, if you, if you write off all of your business, so, so let's say year one, you didn't make any, you, well, you made a little money uh, and you have a, how can schedule C and you have a gross income, an, an, I'm sorry, a net income of $600. So, you notice that you have to pay self-employment tax. 
600 or 400. I think it's 600. No, $400. So you have to play self-employment tax. Then you look at, well, if I write all of this off, or if I write off, let's say the furniture and fixtures, that gives me a negative number. So I don't owe any self-employment tax. Next year, you made, I don't know, $20,000. So when you're thinking about how you depreciate and how you amortize, you always wanna look at both the state implications and if my business is more successful this year, will me writing off things last year increase my taxes for the following year? And I'm gonna say that again. So I write everything off this year. I make small profit. Next year, or I, I'll say 2021, just did the taxes for 2021. This year, my profits increased to $20,000. But I've written off everything in 2021. So I made that, so that $1,500 or, or $2,500 may reduce my taxes in 2022. So there always has to be uh, a financial plan uh, and a strategic plan, as well as a state plan, a state plan looking at how does this uh, implicate, how the, what is, when, if I do something with the state, how will that affect both my federal and my state return? All right, uh, let me go back up, hold on. Okay, so <clears throat> we're still talking about, about startup costs. For the most part, we don't think that we need a salary when we when we when we when we start our business. We don't think that we need a salary. If you are working for yourself and you have mortgage, rent, car note, whatever that you have to pay, then you you your your business is not only going the I'm sorry, your business would not only have to finance itself, it has to finance your living expenses. Uh, note for tax. If you have a Schedule C, you cannot pay yourself wages, which means that whatever you take out is considered a owner's draw. So it cannot be deducted from the bottom line, but you still need to account for that. Prepaid insurance premiums. Do are you going to hire? Do I need workers comp? Uh, I needed um, errors and omission insurance. I needed that. Uh, do I am if I walk if I have a uh, business where I'm in a uh, let's say a storefront? Do I need liability insurance? Ensuring that that's like one of the first things that you need to to consider your legal and accounting fees. It is a good, a wonderful idea to uh, meet with your legal profession. And I know that the Women Benedict, I mean, Benedict's College Women's Business Center has legal assistance provided that you are part of the, or, or vetted in that group where you can meet with an attorney to review your documents. You need to have your seal. You need to ensure that all of your documents in place. I did a DYI because, you know, I'm smart. And I think I know what I'm doing. Then I had my attorney friend look at my paperwork for my LLC. Come to find out, I had checked the wrong box and the wrong box said that if anything happened in my business, then my personal assets could be attached. I didn't read all of that. So having uh, a good attorney in place to take a, a look at that. Let me just keep a, keep a breath of time. Um, do you need rent deposits? Do you need utilities? What supplies are you using? What type of licensing that you using? And anything is $150, you always need pens, paper, whatever. Uh, and a part of your 
operating capital is what uh, what funds do you have to work with? So if we go back to page to the first one, we say that we need $10,000 just to open the door. Then we say that we need $6,965. So that's the total of everything I need in order for my business to stay afloat. <clears throat> All right. This is, and I'm and I, I didn't mention this. You, I'm sorry. Uh this this is the score. Um the score Excel spreadsheet. And I'll walk you through that as we as we uh get through the did, did we did we send that out, Kate? Okay, so by the way, I'm using the score Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I think we did, Celia. I think yeah, we, okay. uh, when we sent it out, sent the, the other document out. Okay. So when we talk about source of funding, regardless of whether you use seed funding, I think there is Cabbage, American Express, SBA, whatever your, your family and friends, what they want to know, first of all, is what are you bringing to the table? So even though my owner's equity does not all does not meet, does not, I'm sorry, all of my owner's equity is not cash because I have my office expenses. I mean, because I was able to set up my office, et cetera. 50% of what I need, I am funding myself. If you can find 20%, you, you can do that as, as well. But you want to, when you're talking to an investor, a banker, seed funding, however you want to finance, the first question they will ask is, what do you bring to the table? Now, I needed some outside investor that happened to be my husband, so, but he's still outside. Uh, so he gave me 1697. Now, the other part of this is I know that I am going to need, uh, I'm going to put some stuff on my credit card. So that's 40%. Your total source of funding needs to be 100%. But then as you look at what I'm generating here, the owner's equity doesn't have anything. That's what I, that's what I own. There's no loan rate involved. There are no monthly payments. I didn't apply for a commercial loan or vehicle loan. But if you notice, if I finance 40% through my credit card, that's $6,786, my interest rate is 22%, which means that before I even open my door, I have a monthly payment of 187. And those are things that you have to think about as well. Uh, are there any questions at this point? All right. Oh, Liz, I didn't see anything. Kate, I didn't see anything. Any okay. Questions. So your startup requirements equals your fixed assets or basically on your balance sheet, what, what typically are capital expenses, they don't generate any, uh, any, any uh, income. Your operating capital is what you need to generate income. So if you uh, are making a widget, then what you're gonna include in your operating cap capital, uh, what inventory you need in, in, what inventory you need in order to uh, create that operating capital. And then the next part of that is your source of funding. And that includes you, your family members, your uh, investors, seeding, banking, uh, and, and so forth. Now, after you figure out what you need in order for you to 
move forward or open the door, now you got to figure out what you need in order for you to uh, be successful in the first year. You want to start off with the first year. Reasonably, when I look at my expenses, excuse me, when I look at my expenses, I'm sorry, forgive me. I, 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 I recognize that my expenses are $2,500 a month. I know I'm going to need that in order for me to be okay. So I'm the first employee. I need to make $2,500 a month. That is $30,000 a year. But if you look at the total salary, it's $37,399 a year. Because in that income, I've got to include my Social Security and Medicare. And this is when uh, most entrepreneurs don't pay attention to the bottom line. Uh, they don't put in the self-employment tax uh, as a part of their uh, as a part of the gain. So at the end of the year, when you file your taxes, if you made thirty thousand dollars, the first thing that's going to hit your taxes would be the um, would be the social the 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 weight. I mean, the income subject to self employment, and that piece cannot be changed. Uh, I mean, you can have credits up to that, but that. So when I'm looking at the thirty thousand dollars that I want to pay myself even though it's going to be considered an honest draw, I also recognize that of that $30,000, I need to have somewhere stored in my account so that when, when the tax man comes, which he will, I'll have funds to pay for my, uh, to do my payroll taxes, self-employment taxes. All right, so we figured out what we are going to start up with. We figured out what our needs are as it relates to uh, payroll. Now we have to determine what our cost, I mean, what our products are, what our products or services are going to be. This is where competitive pricing comes into play. This is where your market research comes into play. This is where you understand the trends and your uh, competitors today, as well as your um, future competitors. Pricing out your product line. This is what I do. I said that in order for, so I priced it out. Audit preparation is $500. Technical advisor, $1,000. Income reconciliation, Set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if it's something that I need to do hourly, that's $75 an hour. Okay. For those who serve, uh, for those who sell product, your price per unit, let's say is $500. Your cost of goods sold is $100. So that's my margin. Typically, when you're talking about products, your margin isn't that high. But for those of us who are in service, we also need to determine what the price, what the uh, what the 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 cost or the indirect cost and direct cost. For service organizations, your labor cost typically is your highest cost because it's what make what it, it is what drives your business. Pricing out your product line or service. Alan talked about this on your, on last week. Is it a cash cow, cow or a poor dog? The cash cow means that we're making money. The poor dog means that it's just draining uh, space. When we talk about uh, uh, Blockbuster last last year, Blockbuster was doing great. I mean, it was a, a bunch of video. Uh, video stores that, and I remember had to, you know, you go on Friday nights, pick up your video, make sure you take it back on Monday so that you could get it taken care of. Actually, Netflix went 
to Blockbuster and said, look, we want to make this a leg of our business and Blockbuster said no. That cash cow became a poor dog and they eventually went out of business. You have to always pay, pay attention to trends because, tr because product or services, they, they, they go in waves. Uh, you, introduction, adaptation, then do we need to add something to it so it can continue to be marketable? Or is it something that's on the downswing? Your business plan, uh, as you researching, and, and when we say research, we mean research um, all the time. Understanding where your trends are. Two years ago, three years ago, a tax return was easily $1,000 because you had to do it manually. Now a tax return, uh, a business tax return is probably $500. And if I don't look, if I don't pay attention to the trends, then I don't know what the competitive rate is. All right. After you priced out your product, then you want to make an adjustment on what is your growth rate. Uh, I want my growth rate to be 15% from year one to year two. Uh, I want my growth, growth rate to be uh, 25% between year two and year three. Growth rate is not a fiction number. It's not a number in the sky. It's you doing market research to determine are there products that I can add to this? Are there products that I can leverage off of? I did this before inflation actually came into play which means that because inflation is a part of the process, my growth rate for it from year one to year two more than likely will be, um, will be lower. So it is a good idea every year to take a look at your profit and your loss. If your business is, re is growing relatively fast, then you wanna do that on a quarterly basis. You want to make sure that you're paying attention to trends, ensure that you have enough data, as uh, Alan said last week, have enough data where you can make some kind of choices as it relates to what it is that, that you need to do, and then make those adjustments as it, as it relates to your cash flow. And I hope you guys can see this. What I did was I... And I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you the, the spreadsheet in, uh, in about 10 minutes. After I priced everything out, after I paid attention to my gross margin, then the system actually, or that spreadsheet actually calculated it based on what I feel should be for year one, year two, and year three. And then it's telling me uh, the units that I've sold, what my margin needs to be, where do I want to go? And then you, you have to continue to go back and forward to pay attention to uh, the process. Uh, yes, we need to talk about this. As we are in business, two things drive, that drive your cash flow, accounts payables and accounts receivables. You want to extend your accounts payables to and when you are working with your vendors. I mean, typically it's net 15, net 30. Pay those within you know, 30 days. Also, you need to pay attention to your accounts receivables, specifically if you are in services. We talked about uh, government contracts. Government contracts are the bone but they take a minute for you to get paid with those. So understanding what your ratio is to how many of your clients pay on time, how many of your clients uh, pay within between 30 and 60 days. And then you always want to allow for what we call bad debt. I uh, did a tax return. I charged the person $285. It's been four months. They haven't paid me. 
that's probably going to end up being bad, bad debt. The same thing as it relates to your accounts payables, because these affect your, uh, this affects your cash flow as well as your balance sheet. Going back to the front end, we looked at what I desire my minimum cash in the bank that I should have, which was $3,500. And then I have a line of credit, which is my credit card. That's the interest rate on, which is the 22%. The other thing too, is you wanna pay attention to your tax rate. If you're a corporation, you're taxed upfront. If you're 1120S, which is a shareholder, that, that, that depend, I mean, that, your, your, that tax rate is predicated on your personal tax rate. If you're LLC, uh, your income subject to self-employment is a separate taxation is typically around 0.765%. There are some other calculations that, that are involved, but you also, I mean, you want to make sure that you pay attention to your tax rate. Uh, after you've gone through and priced out your product, then you wanna look at your total expenses. And I'm not gonna, um, be too long on this because we I mean most of us know uh, our expenses. And a, and a common question people ask me is, can I write off my travel expenses? And I want to answer that question. If your business, or if you are going, let's say I'm going to a, uh, I'm going to a conference, a tax conference in Atlanta. Uh, let's say in July. So my cost of that conference is 200, well, no, it's like $570. Uh, the, the conference is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So that's hotel fee. Um, and I'm just rounding up a number. 300, that's 500, that's another $500. That's $1,000. Uh, I'm going to drive there. So we're talking... Mm, let's round it up to another hundred dollars. So we got eleven hundred dollars so far. That is right. That that you can write off. But if you decide that you want, well, and I will. Uh, I'm going to decide that I'm just going to stay until Atlanta until Sunday. That conference is over on thursday that means that the expenses for friday saturday and sunday those are not necessarily um travel well no those aren't business expenses some of the things that the irs really to hone in on for small businesses is is your travel meals and entertainment because we typically can we'll dump some stuff into into that number when it's not necessarily um, business expenses. As it relates to uh, your home office, if you are employed by someone else, even if you worked uh, at home during the pandemic, you cannot write that out. However, if you are self-employed, you can write off your, um, your home office expenses. I typically take the simplified because it's just easier and it's left that's less to explain. Anything that the the anything that the government gives, I mean anything that the IRS gives you the simplified method of take that unless there's clear documentation or clear de de delineation uh, between the business expense and the home expense. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Can you repeat that again? Because I think that was really good advice. You know, just basic general advice about, you know, um, oh, my this, about the simplified. Um, oh, OK. So so there, so so I know. So there is the specifically with the Schedule C, you can take your home expenses up to your profit. You could actually take your home in the form as the 8829. You can actually carry some of that those expenses over. I typically use the simplified method 
because it does not require a whole lot of explanation. My office is uh, 200 square feet. My home is 2187 square feet. I divide that 20, that 200 square feet by the 2187. There is a simple, click the simplify method. And then I don't have to explain about, okay, did I use, uh, how many utilities did I use? Was the was the 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 depreciation on the home taken into into consideration? It's a, it's an easier route, and I will say this about vehicles. And I'm kind of veering off a little bit, so let me get back to where we are. When you when you take um, vehicles depreciation depreciation on anything. Um, that typically signifies that it is a business asset. If you abandon that asset, sell it, et cetera, that depreciation that you were able to, to take, you have to recapture that as ordinary income. So the, the, for mallet, take your mallet, easier, no recapturing income. For home expenses, uh, let's go simplify. And I'm going to just put, put it all together. What I'm going to do now, because I think the rest of this is about putting it all together. So what I want to do is just stop sharing and then open up the uh, open up the spreadsheet so we can take a look at that for a second. And while I'm doing this, if there are any questions, questions please let me know. There was one question a little bit earlier that was asking um, where in the startup requirement spreadsheet would you place marketing funds needed or estimated? I know okay, so, the expenses that you put the marketing and advertising together, um, but I'm going to show that to you right now. Okay, perfect. I'm walking you through the spreadsheet. It is, I was actually quite impressed to be truthful. Um, you can fill all of this out uh, as well. You got that and you have to use the one, two, three, four for any, for any, excuse me, to unlock any of the, of the spreadsheets. So the starting point basically is when we're talking here is this is what I did. That is what we want to, enter all of our information in as it relates to what we need to start up. There are a lot of, you can click on your links here to get to your loan amortization or your depreciation schedule if you want to get that intense. Everywhere you see that there is a, so let me do this. If I take this number out, if you notice, that number changed that when you see the red, it actually is telling you that you need some more uh, funding. What did I, oh, I think that was for you. Jerry, can you zoom in a little bit? Uh, zoom in, oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. So if you notice, uh, I changed this to 30%, the 10%. So it's telling me, that you require more funding. And if I change that back to 40%, it's telling me that you're fully funded. If you are a new business, then you only need to deal with the fixed access, the operating capital, and the source of funding. If you are an existing business, you can use this as well by adding in whatever cash you have that's on hand. And the system, I mean, and the spreadsheet itself actually does an excellent job with walking you through the process. So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with starting my business. If you move to QuickBooks and you fill this information out, you can very easily put this information into your QuickBooks. And that's a whole nother class in Excel. And let me see if I can zoom this out. So when we started off with our employees, I, I gave it the, you know, if you have more than one employee, you'll have to do that as well. What's the estimated value? That's my estimated month. And then 
It also calculated my taxes. And at the end of the period, it gave me the annual period. So starting off with the number of employees, whether it's full-time or part-time, adding in those amounts, the system is going to actually calculate the rest of it for you, as well as calculating your uh, social security taxes. So I'm paying myself $2,500, but my actual expense on my, on my, uh, Val I'm like, on income statement is $3,117. So then it kind of takes that information and I'm not going to go so fast. It takes that information and it forecasts it out for you for the three years. Okay, so let me go to... Okay, so this is my sales. And as, as I took my product line, I actually priced that out based on one month. You can actually do this on a 12 month period or you can do it month to month. For tax accountants, um, where's my tax returns? For tax accountants, which is another thing I need to bring up, for the most part, you need to understand the, the, the workflow of your business. As a tax accountant, January and February, slow. March, April, I've got more work than I can deal with. May, June, July, slow. After the kids go back to school, then we got, we've, we've got, I've got more work to deal with. That is where you just can determine gaps in your business. Do I need to incorporate other things as well? So if you look at my tax returns, they're not set out by every I mean, they're not set out by every month. They're actually, I'm looking at the flow of my work. So start in by pricing out your product. What is my sales price? What is my cost? What is my cost of goods? Uh, and if you're a service organization, you really don't have cost of goods. But, it, you know, $75 an hour, it's going to take me two hours to do it, $150. That, that is what my margin is as well. Uh, all right, and then it moves it to, and most of this stuff is calculating. Uh, so I won't hold it, talk to you very, very long. After that, then it starts to calculate because I told it that I wanted a 15% growth in year one and I wanted a 25% growth in year two. So then it actually moves it so that I'm able, so so the, the system is doing that for me as well. There are some additional inputs that I wasn't, oh, this is where I talked about my accounts receivables. So it goes through each piece. Some of those are where we start off with, where we have to add the numbers to it. Others are where we want to, create the growth rate. This entail is going to create to is going to create your cash flow. And it goes year one, year one to one to three. And then it provides you a a, a, a income statement statement and those are generated and those are generated. The last thing I really want to talk about is uh, your monthly break even. After you complete, and let me enlarge this as well. After you complete all of the information, all of the data input, the system will tell me that uh, my monthly break even amount, in other words, in order for me to recoup my indirect costs, my labor costs, my direct costs, I need to make $5,637 which means that this is my total fixed cost divided by my, my gross margin and my total sales. That's my break even. How much money do you need to make in order for you to start at zero? So anything over the $5,637 theoretically is, um, is, um, 
profit. All right, and this is the last piece that I am going to talk about. Um, well, so as we go through the process, those, those ratios that I told you about, those that's provided to you as well. And I'm sure that's a whole nother class in Excel, but let's just talk about what the system, after I did this, what the system actually told me that I needed to do. And this is, this is the diagnostic tool. Can everybody see this? Can you see this? Okay. So based on the industry. Can you zoom in a little bit more though? Okay. Please, thank you. Okay, based on the industry, my owner's cash injection into my business is 50%. The system says that it is reasonable. It's saying that I'm requiring this, it's telling me that that is reasonable. It's telling me that my interest rates are reasonable. It's telling me that my margins, okay, so this right here, look at what it says, owner's compensation may be they be too high relative to the profitability of the business. So it's telling me that based on the money I'm making, that my labor costs for sure you're taking care of myself is too high. Uh, it's telling me that, and then you can go back and then adjust. That's what I'm saying. And then it's telling me, me that my profit my prop profitability is doesn't seem reasonable. There was one thing I wanted to see. One thing that it says. Oh, hold on one second. What was something in here that I? Oh, that's what I'm saying. It's telling me that my balance sheet is not. That, that I'm off by $2,500. And it's saying that my balance sheet is not in balance. So going back to my starting point, I need to make sure that my balance sheet is in, is in balance. So you, the, what I would do if I was doing this on my own, I would save this spreadsheet to my desktop and create a copy. That way you can break, break it, whatever you need to do so that you understand what uh, needs to take place. And then after you finish it, you can um, put it into your, um, I'm sorry, put it into your, your, what are we working on? Business, your business boot camp. Yes. 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 So, uh -huh. so do you think, you know, based on what you just said, I think that's a really good example um, do you think that that's a great way of also um, doing scenarios, coming up with scenarios? It is a great way of coming. Yes, it is. Uh, it is a great, great way of coming up with scenarios. The, so a, a lot. I want to say this correctly. A successful business has to have three things. One of them include insight and being able to understand what if scenarios. That comes from your uh, from understanding your, your market. The other thing is strategies objectives, policies, and procedures, as well as quality control. 
the insight, so you can have all of the policies and, and oh, and then creativity. You can have all of the policies, processes, strategies, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't have insight and creativity, your business will fail. So will you say that again? Because I, those are really good points. So, um, so you need insight. Insights. You need policies and procedures. Policies and procedures. And you need creativity. You say strategy and control too, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so your strategy, your strategy, and your objectives and your goals drives your policies and your procedures, which includes quality control. That needs to be standard, in the box, understanding break even, understanding uh, what drives your profit. Understand that's 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 a box thing. Follow those goals. That's that's not in the in that's not a out of the box thing. That's a, those are your non-negotiables. Those are your non-negotiables. Your insight is directly related to marketing strategy. I'm not saying marketing trends, understanding your current and future competitors. That requires vision. That means you need to have, um, you need to be in the clouds doing the birds, doing the birds eye view. Then you need to have creativity in order for all of this to flow. Okay. Okay. Not having vision is detrimental. Okay. And I'm going back to church on this one. Yeah. The so Bible yeah, says, yeah. Alana said, preach, Shilia. <laughs> the Bible says, write the vision, make it plain so others can run with it. So I've got insight. I'm writing a vision, which is my business plan that controls my uh, that controls my operational policies and procedures. Then the next thing I got to have is my creativity. So insight and creativity equals policy and processes. Sure. Will you do me a favor and bring up your spreadsheet again? Sure. Because. Um, uh... Well, I want to emphasize something you just talked about in relationship to your spreadsheet. Go back to the page where it had the diagnostics on it. Yes, sir. Please, ma'am. Not a problem. Um, and so, so what I want to emphasize something she said is that she talked about um, being able to control quality control. Um, and the one of the benefits of this diagnostic is that if you're thinking about um, some of the things that share, right? So it says owner compensation is at the upper limit, right? Owner's compensation may be too high relative to the profitability of the business, right? But then you but then you take into consideration that the owner's cash injection to the business is reasonable, right? It's 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 fifty percent value, right? You may work those things opposite from each other, right? And so if you have, you know, significant amounts of resources to put cash into the business at this point, what you may do um, is reduce your cash injection. Um, and help me if I'm thinking about this correctly, Shea. You're right. I, I'm re right. Reduce my cash injection, which would make you know, the cash that I'm putting into the business lower from a personal perspective. So I have more cash for to address personal issues, which right. means I can then lower my personal cash flow, right? That I'm taking my personal compensation out of the business and, and see how that affects the business's sustainability in that first year. Right? That 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 is that's absolutely correct. Okay, okay. Okay. Absolutely correct. So, 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 and, 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 you know, the business, being in business means that you, you, and I, I want to say this with means that you will uh, make mistakes, means that you will, will say that 
there's a product that's absolutely amazing and it may fail, but the goal is to always keeping your keeping your hand on the ball. And 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 one of the things that I have is a coach that uh, typically we meet every Friday from uh, three to four. The coach helps me because when I'm in the weeds and I'm working and I'm trying to get a client and I'm doing all of this, the coach pulls me out of the weeds and then puts me in a place that, where I'm 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 uh, taking the airplane taking the airplane view or the um, or the um, bird's eye view because as business owners. We can work ourselves out of business, which means if I'm doing everything, number one, if I'm doing everything, number one, and I'm trying to satisfy uh, my clients, uh, number two, I, I, I lose my vision. Uh, we, my coach and I, we went back, and this, this is, you know, honest. When I first set up my business, I said that. 10 clients is what I know that I can successfully uh, take care of. And I'm not talking tax returns. I'm talking about bookkeeping, et cetera, et cetera. 10 clients was, was what I could successfully take care of on a monthly basis and give them a quality of service that they need. We looked at where we are today, it's time for me to bring somebody on at least on a part-time basis because my client, Shilia, if Shilia continues to work on those, the, the additional clients, then my business stops because I can't market anymore. I can't see the vision anymore. So you have to always, in addition to uh, strategies and all, you, you need someone that pulls you out, out, out of the of the weeds so that you can um, run your business, work your business, but keep the vision of your business moving as well. Cause it's a move, businesses are moving, business is a moving target. All right, that's a good point, Shelia. You know, um, you made me think about something, you know, so, you know, Shelia uh, mentioned market research, you know, that's one of my topics. That's what I really, one of the things I like. You know, so a lot of times the question comes up with, well, how do I know when, you know, I need to hire someone or bring somebody on? You know, one of the ways that we um, uh, take a look at that is we look at um, from a percentage of sales perspective um, relationship to your labor costs, right? So Shelia talked about when we were using that example um, from about her and labor components. Um, one of the things is you can look and see, you know, um, compared to others in the industry, your size, where from a percentage of sales, um, does your labor cost compare to theirs, right? And so, for example, if, if, if you're looking at one company or you're looking at a few companies and, you know, all of you all generate um, $2 million in sales, and, you know, it's for um, uh, a size company with five employees or less. And you see that, you, you know, their cost is at 10% of sales. And you're looking at, and then you say, oh, well, my cost is at 15% of sales, right? You, you, know, you might be paying too much or you might have too many people on staff that are not doing as much work as they could be doing based on your labor pool, right? Can and vice versa. Can I piggyback on that, that too? Uh, so, you know, there are methods and working with someone like Shelia, myself or some of the other entities can help you kind of begin to back into some of that, you know, and, and that's one of the benefits that she's talking about of having outside eyes um, someone that can, you know, um, provide an objective view to your business. You know, Shelia talked about having um, your head um, in the game, right? Your head in the game and eyes on the ball is, is one of the things I say. You know, Shelia, um, what 
what would you say about you know um, percentage of sales, labor pools, and things of that nature? What advice would you before, give? Before be, before I address that, let me let me say this. So, and and not being flippant, but no. I am an enrolled agent. I have an MBA. I'm working on my doctorate. I when you when 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 I work on something. My fee is $125. Reg well, I charge somebody for that as well. I can bring somebody in to do my bookkeeping at what, $18, $20 an hour. So then that means that my labor cost realistically is going down, even though I'm still involved in that. So that that that's one of the um avenues you 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 look at as well price yourself reasonably based on my credentials the going rate for me giving you services is 175 dollars regardless of whether i charge you that or not that's the going rate so when i'm looking at that from a competitive scheme the 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 theory would be that if i bring on someone where I can charge the client $35 or $40, you know, for, for whatever it is for, for an, an hour. Mm -hmm. I can actually address more clients based on that, that, that number. So opportunity cost comes into play with pricing your price, being honest about your price, being honest about your true labor cost. And saying that, okay, if I was running, let's say, uh, PwC, who would I use to do this work? I would bring somebody else in that I could pay twenty dollars an hour for to do this work. So you have to look at it from that point. Okay. I would say that if you if your business is at a at, at a profit of twenty percent, provided that and um, and we're talking you know, $75,000 or more, and you have the um, wherewithal to bring someone in, uh, you can do that as well. Alternatively, doing busy season, call ND. Call one of the temp agencies that takes all of the, the stress from me as it relates to workers' comp, 941, uh South Carolina, all of that stuff, they take on that that uh that piece and bring them in for while, while my busy season is on. So there are off there are independent contractors. There are um there are ways to get around it. What I will say though, I think we had a class maybe uh I don't know whether it was this class or the other class. Recognizing the difference between an independent crank contractor and an and an, and an employee, and that that's that's a whole another class. Yeah, that's in a it. whole. That's a, that's a whole ongoing conversation, right? And so, uh, you um, you you covered a, a lot of good things. Um, you talked about managing costs. Um, I have a question, but I want to um, de defer my question to see if there are any other questions in the chat before I go because we're at 12 11 23 right now I did not see I don't see so so um so she, you know um you know early in business you know um if, if a person hasn't really you know been exposed to how businesses operate you know what what you may see you say may may see co-mingling of 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 money <laughs> right you know so um can you talk about the importance of you know having separate accounts and um separating business and personal expenses you know and some of you know some of the some of the challenges that may exist but you know definitely um why it's extremely important that you do that okay so so contrary to popular belief the IRS does not require that you have a separate bank account. It does require that you have separate books. So uh, while that, that, that's, that's the code. On the other hand, 
On the other hand, I like shoes. If you, if you heard me talk, I love shoes. I buy shoes that I don't have nothing to wear with. I have shoes in my closet that I need to find something to wear with. If I'm walking around with my business credit card in my hand and I don't have my phone with me, if I got all my money in one account, even though that $500 belongs to the business, my personal nature, it gonna, I'm buying those shoes. So what I did was I did two things. Uh, not, I mean, Bank of America, I use Choice. They have a, a really good uh, program for uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, so I set up a bank account with Choice, with BBNT at the time. I did not get a debit card with that bank account. Everything that goes through that bank account has to go um, either, you know, ACH or, uh, or actually ACH. I took one of my credit cards that uh, I rarely use and I put all my businesses, my business expenses on that as well. You don't have to have QuickBooks. You, you can use Excel. However, you need to get a QuickBooks, a Xero, uh, whatever, a Quicken, one of those, so that you have, uh, QuickBooks will, will, if you enter the information in, it will create a balance sheet for you. It will create an income statement for you as well. One of the things that, um, and this is this is actually true, in 2017, the IRS did close to 80,000 um, 80, audits. 10,000 of them, the IRS, IRS was able to get money, I mean, get money from the client because for whatever reason, it, it was favorable to the IRS. The balance of them, it was, it was favorable to the individual, which means that uh, the individuals did not have accurate records when they did their taxes. They lost out. You can get a refund within, now the, the IRS can audit you back in, what, 1999 if you were living then. Um, that, and I'm going to answer, do we need a business coach then? Okay. Um, the IRS can audit you since the first time you've been doing taxes. If you owe them, they can continue to find you forever. You can only get your refund up to three years, which means that if they audit you in 2017 and they find out that you, that you, that they owe you money. Theoretically, you've lost your money because the, the refunds are up to three years. Businesses fail not only because of bad concepts. They fail. The, the major reason business fails are because of bad records, no processes, uh, and the lack of organization. So those are things personally that you need to have. And if you are starting off now, create or find a system that you can work with. So when your business blows up, cause that's why we're here, we want you to make money. You have accounting principles and practices in place. The business plan talked about all of that um, before the business plan talked about all of that. So we need to do that. And then I'm going to answer this last question before we go. Do we need a business coach then? No. Who do you know that, that, uh, that you work with that know more than you do? My friend, I call him my coach, but he really is someone that I know 
does processes and 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 um and policies so i'm using the people in my circle to ask questions to you don't have to pay for a coach there Alan is a coach. I'm a coach. Cheryl's a coach. Kate's a coach. There is so much free information. SBA are coaches. So um don't 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 pay for a coach, please. And, and now I interject, you know, um, so like she said, you know, um the the was agencies that's representing here that's bringing you the series, you know, were um, especially created to help you right, start, run, and grow your business you know, from an economic development perspective. You know, um, the services that you get through our office, which are one-on-one, -on -one, um, no fee confidential consulting, quote unquote coaching, um, is paid for by you already through your taxes. Same with the SCORE, with the WBC, any, any of those resource partners that you know, work with the SBA. You know, I I do believe sometimes though um, that you need to pay for coaching, and and I say that because you know if if you're a consultant um, and you have a business, you know, when you consult with someone, you know, there's there's some maybe some specific insights that you're helping them to resolve or you're providing. Um, they should pay you for your insights. And so it, it, it depends on where you are and what type of information you need, what type of assistance um, you need to determine who and when, you know, and so um, start out in your market and in, in your personal network. If you don't have the insights there, you know, um, reach out and out beyond your network and see if there's opportunity there. You know, um, there was a question about um, investors. You know, um, I'm I'm gonna share something and show you before we get off. I know um, we're at 2 30, 11.32, but you know, um, you you really need to determine. You know, so what determines um, in large part what type of investor you get and how you approach it uh, depends on um, the possible size of your business can grow, right? And so think about from an investment perspective. Most investors um, are looking for a 10x return. Meaning if they put, you know, a um, dollar in, they want $10 back, right? So if they put a thousand in, they want 10,000 back. If they put a million in, they want 10 million back. Um, and so part of the approach there is figuring out what the capacity um, your business has from a invest from a return perspective as a top line revenue. And that's where the tool that Shilia just went through add so much value because it's going to tell you what capacity yet your business has to do at a top line revenue, what type of revenue, right? And so, the, so your approach um, depends on the size of the company you're going to have. Um, if it's a smaller size company, then you would probably approach, you know, friends, you know, people in your personal network um, for smaller amounts of capital. Um, and then as your revenue sources um, grow, right, your revenue grows, looking for, looking for people outside of your network, you know, immediately like angel investors. And then there are some local entities here in the state of South Carolina where you can get um, investments, you know, um, as well, you know, some convertible notes and things of that nature. Are you on, you on mute? Yeah, right? yeah. We're going to uh, close out. Uh, the, I will, okay, you, first of all, you will be provided the slides. Uh, the There's a YouTube video of, of everything that we, we have here. Next week is about um, the executive plan and market, the executive sum, summary and marketing. For those who want additional assistance as it relates to this Excel spreadsheet, we will still have the uh, the uh, follow up meeting on next Tuesday. And I try to just go through step by step of what we talked about. It's not recorded because I want it to be a collaborative where we can all talk and be honest about where we are. And it has been a pleasure 
to uh, be able to assist you guys. I hope that this is assisting you. Also, there is a survey uh, that is generated by the uh, City of Columbia Office of Business Opportunity that will, uh, where you can say that we want additional training on XYZ and we will provide, I'm sorry, we will provide that as well. So hopefully this uh, information was educational. We look forward to, to providing you with this, these services again and uh, a copy of the chat will also be in um, will also be in the documentation as it relates to uh, this webinar. Guys, it is eleven thirty-five. I have taken an extra five minutes of your time. I appreciate it. I know it was a lot of information. But we're here to, to assist you as well. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you, Sheila. Y'all have a great day.